Philadelphia's Winter Speaker Series. It seems a little odd to be saying Winter Speaker Series when the crocuses are, are coming out and spring is right around the corner, but we are in the final few weeks of our Winter Speaker Series. It is such a pleasure to have you all here this evening. I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director of the Athenaeum. On the screen, you also see Tess Galen, our wonderful events coordinator who helps make sure everybody can join us virtually for our programs and our guest tonight, who I will introduce in just one moment. If you are a member of the Athenaeum, you know that we are a place for people who love to read and learn about our world, for people who are passionate about Philadelphia, about our built environment, and about the people who live in our city. If this sounds like the type of place that you wanna be a part of, I encourage you to contact us and learn more about becoming a member. We would love to have you join our community of learners and doers and thinkers and dreamers. Before I introduce our guests, I wanna remind you about uh, how to use uh, this uh, Zoom to the best effect. First of all, this is a webinar, so you are not seen or heard, so don't worry um, about having to pick up the phone or anything else, we can't hear you. Uh, if you are on a computer or a laptop, you will see an icon in the top right-hand corner that says speaker view or gallery view. You want to have speaker view to get the best experience during the talk that will allow you to see our speaker and her slides and um, not see Tess and me. So you can really focus on what's happening. Also, at the very bottom of your screen, you will see a couple of icons. One is a chat icon. I see a few people have used that already. It's a great place to send out your, your kudos to our speaker, or if you're having any technical problems that we might be able to help you, Tess or I, you can put those there. The Q&A is the great place to put your questions. And after um, Ms. Griffin has finished her, her talk, we will be doing Q&A. And so you may put your questions there anytime that they come up during the talk. Now, our guest tonight was referred to by someone today to me as a shiro, a hero for architecture community, for, for cities and all places that seek to find better ways for everybody to live vibrant and full lives. Tony Griffin asked us tonight a question that I hope that we can all engage in further. Would we design better places if we put the values of equality, inclusion, or equity first? I'm looking forward to this discussion and hearing what, uh, what Ms. Griffin has to say. Tony Griffin is founder of Urban AC LLC, which is based in New York, and it's a planning and design management practice that works with public, private, and nonprofit partnerships to reimage, reshape, and rebuild just cities and communities. So the PAC practice designs, leads, and manages complex and transformative social and spatial urban revitalization revitalization frameworks, including she helped work with Philadelphia um, to get the rebuild program off the ground several years ago. Um, she's also a professor in practice of urban planning at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where she teaches design studios and seminars, also rooted in issues of social and spatial justice. She is the founder and director of the Just City Lab, an applied research platform that investigates the ways cities can have design can have a positive impact on addressing the conditions of injustice in cities. You can find that at www.designforthejustcity.org and we'll get that up there on the chat um, during this program so you can learn more if you're just hearing about this program. Tony, I am so grateful to you for the time that you are granting us tonight and invite everybody to join me in a virtual warm welcome to Tony Griffin. Welcome. Thank you, um, Beth and Tess. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and just one quick clarification, I can't take any credit for helping to start the rebuild uh, program, but we did work with some of the partners to take a look at ways of evaluating the effectiveness of the program. So nice to virtually be back uh, in Philly in some way. Um, so let me dive right in and show uh, just a few slides uh, that then will allow us to go into conversation. And what I thought I'd do is just um, kind of walk you through a little bit of a trajectory of how I came to be thinking about this notion of justice and the just city. Uh, through the path uh, of my career and practice. So I will share my screen uh, and jump right in. Um, so it's important to me um, as I reflect on the work that I do um, uh, to frame it as being very much rooted in my own identity and that identity and relationship to others and, uh, and other environments. 
uh, the intention that I have over the course of my career sort of baked into the way I practice. Um, and at the forefront, you know, keeping uh, very present uh, the imagination, whether I'm practicing as an architect, urban designer, or planner, I firmly believe that all of those disciplines as design disciplines, uh, part of our responsibility is to help imagine uh, futures that address both opportunity and challenge. So um, let's start with my identity. Uh, so this is my, I think my first grade class. And this is just to situate myself in the context um, of the South Side of Chicago, which even today, still one of the most racially segregated cities uh, in the United States. My entire uh, environment and experience growing up as a child and K through 12 was predominantly African-American. Uh, so I was uh, the majority in most of the spaces where I learned, played, shot, recreated, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that is me. Uh, it wasn't until uh, I decided at the age of 14 that I wanted to be an architect, uh, applied to schools, and ultimately enrolled at the University of Notre Dame that I really began to sort of take a different um, stock of my identity uh, within the context of the environment. Uh, so at the time where I was in school, um, there were only seven of uh, women in my class of 47, which is radically changed. Uh, very happy to say that most programs of architecture and planning uh, are at least 50% women, if not more. Um, but has that changed so much for people of color? Uh, there were only three African-Americans in this class. Uh, there I am in the shadow of the open door. Um, and that statistic remains pretty flat today. There are less than 2% of all licensed architects in the United States that are African-American, less than four that are Hispanic. And there are just um, under 500 African-American women who have ever been licensed in the United States. Um, this is where I continue to find myself in a field that is majority um, white, uh, not so much majority male, depends on where you're situated. Um, but my context for the way I do this work is very different and I've had an amazing and successful career. But the point of these slides is, is for each of us to kind of take stock in the identity from which we are from and the ways in which that influences um, all the different ways in which we practice and see and define both the problems and opportunities that we have been trained to work on. And to also remind us that we have multiple identities. I'm only talking about two in the context of, this, of these slides, really three, my professional identity, my gender identity, and my racial identity. But all of us have multiple identities and this work these identities, I believe, and I've sort of grown over the course of my career to recognize how these identities influence how I see the world, but also how I design the world. Um, so I left Notre Dame uh, to work for Skidmore Owings in Maryland, Chicago, where I was a quintessential architect working on large scale uh, corporate architecture projects. These are projects from Liverpool Pool Street Station, uh, the Brock Gate Complex. Uh, working under famed architect Bruce Graham, who uh, was the noted architect for projects like the Sears Tower and the John Hancock building. Um, after spending 10 uh, years or so at SOM, moving through architecture and ultimately becoming an associate partner uh, in the planning and urban design um, group of the firm, uh, I decided to take a break. I did a low fellowship at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And those few years that I spent at SOM in planning and design really opened me up to this larger scope of uh, city making uh, and also the powers uh, that are at the table that ultimately design the cities that we, we're in. Uh, architects are hired consultants most of the time working for different types of clients. Um, and so at some levels, um, when we think about where we are situated on the power and decision-making kind of arc of how cities are built, um, it was through my work at SOM in the um, planning and urban design program that I began to see a broader field of actors uh, making decisions about the built environment of the city. 
So after leaving the Loeb, um, I took my first public sector job in Washington, DC, uh, where I was in charge of neighborhood planning as well as revitalization planning, looking at downtown corridors and waterfronts. And over the course of my six year career there got a really uh, great perspective on what it means to uh, situate a robust uh, planning and design agenda within the public space of a public agency that looks to do planning work that is beyond just a regula the regulatory framework of planning, but also uh, works with community partners to help vision and imagine futures for their place. It was at that time that I was really beginning to question um, as I did this work and we built the planning program uh, to have a significant um, capacity for doing uh, planning and engagement work with the many constituents of the city, residents, business leaders, institutions, uh, coming into DC, another racially divided city, and at the time was still known as Chocolate City because it had a majority population of African Americans. A lot of the fears of neighbors as we were doing this work, again, coming in at a moment where the economy was very strong, and so people were beginning to see new development and new demographics in parts of the cities that had not been there. As we begin to as I begin to now really understand uh, development histories and land narratives as a part of the future building work I'm doing, you begin to recognize that there are lots of tensions at play, as I'm sure you all experience in Philadelphia, that need to be considered as a part of our work. So um, I would, you know, I spent most of my days in meetings <laughs> when I was deputy planning director. So I would often come home and use art and art making as a way of um, keeping my creative flows alive, but also using the work I was doing as inspiration for that. And, and, and these sets of, of um, paintings that I did were really um, evocative of how uh, black folks in DC in particular felt at the time that the city was at a tipping point in the 2000s. Um, and as we saw at the 2010 census, um, uh, the population uh, had dipped below 50% uh, for African-Americans uh, and people were really feeling pushed out. The pressures of uh, a strong economy was beginning to have people feel like ultimately black folks would be eradicated from uh, the context of the city. So I began to really think about whether or not the work that I was doing as an architect, urban designer, and then now in the space of a public official was really having a meaningful impact on what I've now termed social and spatial injustice or urban injustice. At the time, though, I didn't necessarily have a language for it. I just knew that there were a number of inequalities uh, around investment, around um, household vulnerabilities, around housing security, food security, job security that I was continuing to confront in each of the cities that I had worked on. Um, so after I left Washington, D.C., I took my first position of teaching at a Harvard Graduate School of Design. And I've been in, um, at Harvard twice now. I also had a moment to start a design center uh, named after um, J. Max Bond at City College of New York. And because he was an important role model to me and really saw architecture as a social practice, um, I created the center's focus around this question, can design have a meaningful impact on social and spatial justice? Uh, that work has evolved uh, and now is situated at the GSD under the Just City Lab. And so there are a number of different ways in which, oh, my, um, uh, there are a number of different ways that we have interrogated this question through publishing, uh, through design case studies, through oral histories, uh, and through methods of engagement. Um, Everything that I'm about to show you is available for download on our website, design for just, designforthejustcity.org. Um, we've produced a collection of essays. This was our first publication where we invited uh, 26 different authors from around the world uh, in 22 different cities to talk about what it means to be a just city. Uh, and you might find this a really interesting collection, um, both because it has nuanced interpretations of what justice means, depending on where you are, which was really something I wanted to prove out. 
Uh, there is no universal way of looking at justice. Every city and context is quite unique. So you'll see the nuances of how that's discussed in these different cities. We also created a framework to create, provide evidence on how will we know justice shows up when we see it. So we created a framework specifically for the public realm by looking at New York City's public plazas and developing a framework of indicators and metrics that allow cities to evaluate whether there's presence of public life, which is um, a component we did with Gell Studios, as well as urban justice. Um, as I said, we've taken a look at, in cooperation with a number of different designers, 25, 26 different case studies in collaboration with designers that allowed us to take um, a number of different types of projects and interrogate them for the ways in which they might intentionally seek to address issues of social and spatial justice and whether or not on the back end of those projects, uh, whether or not the designers and those communities feel like those aspirations for justice were achieved. Um, we've showcased a number of these projects in two exhibitions that we had the good fortune to do, the first one at Harvard's Graduate School of Design and then the second one at the Center of Architecture here in New York. And then another tool that we've created is something we call the Just City Index. Um, as I said, one of the hypotheses I had is that justice was not universal. Um, and I was really interested in the ways that um, folks were using frameworks around sustainability and resiliency, which do tend to have sort of universal rubrics of measuring whether the presence of sustainability or resiliency is present. I was pushing back on that to say that a just Philly is not the same as a just Tulsa or a just Johannesburg or just Rotterdam. And I was also finding, uh, particularly in the US context where we often find it incredibly difficult to have conversations around justice. Sometimes we have a hard time finding, uh, having conversations around equity or we're trying to create this universal and ubiquitous um, definition of equity I found, I, I found that it was very hard for people to hold a common language to unpack these issues and, and future possibilities for their resolution. Um, so we created the index, which is a vocabulary of 50 values, which we encourage um, all constituents of a city to use when they're trying to come to the table uh, to do shared visioning and collective action believing that these uh, values hold the possibility of creating shared vision before we get to the mechanics of how much affordable housing we need or where should this line of transit go or the distributive sort of aspect of planning. It's our hope that um, as communities can come together to create shared visions through shared values that perhaps the outcomes of our work might lead to greater justice. So we have uh, done this uh, in um, a number of cities from Johannesburg to Rotterdam to Amsterdam to several cities in the US by designing workshops that take um, people through a selection of values and then overlaying those onto an analysis of different sites. Um, we've created different platforms of using the index to design your own engagement methodology for where you are. And all of these tools are again available for download on our website. And for different types of convenings that we've been, either been invited to design these workshops for or that we've done ourselves, we often collect the demographics of how different groups of populations um, both both um, cite what are the pressing conditions of injustice in their cities or in their context before they then go on to talk about the different values. So you can see we've done this for a conference on aging. Um, we convened a group of um, practitioners at the GSD and we've also done this for the Black and Design Conference that's held at the GSD, just to name a few examples. And to prove out the hypothesis that I, I started with, you know, context matters. And so when we began to aggregate some of the inputs from these convenings, you can see the bigger the word, the more prominent or important different parts, regions of our own country thought some of these values were. And what's interesting is the region in the South where you see identity um, highlighted uh, very prominently. This was around 2017 and after the Charlottesville riots. 
uh, which started this conversation about representation in the public realm, whose narratives belong in the public realm. So we were beginning this national debate, which continues about the role of identity and narratives in the public realm. So now pushing this into my work at Urban American City, uh, what I've designed uh, the methodology and ethos and approach um, to the practice is to root ourselves in a disruptive framework of policies and practices that produce outcomes designed very intentionally to break down the historic structures and systems of oppression and equality and access. And I don't limit that to just racial inequality um, or injustice. There's gender inequality, there's uh, generational um, injustice, there's environmental injustice. And so this framework can work for a number of different contexts and identities really rooted in a, a restorative practice, um, being disruptive, values-based, the importance of cultural competency, cross-disciplinary blending community expertise of grassroots and grass tops. It has to be political if we're to be disruptive and it should include means of accountability. So I'd like to end by just uh, sharing with you a current project I'm working on in Chicago for the Emerald South Economic Development Collaborative, which was a nonprofit um, organization started um, post the announcement of the Obama Presidential Center coming to the South Side of Chicago uh, in the historic uh, Washington Park, which is part of the Olmstead Emerald Necklace. And using their uh, intentions for why to see this global institution on the South Side of Chicago, has led us to think about uh, ways with which we must be disruptive in how we think about placekeeping, uh, economic development, uh, community empowerment and engagement. Um, Emerald South um, is made up of the three neighborhoods that surround the Presidential Center and the Olmstead Parks of roughly 90,000 residents and over 700 local businesses. Now, what's interesting about the South Side of Chicago, which shares in history very similar to Philadelphia, um, once the still industry started to collapse in the United States, which was a driving economy for the South Side and families um, in terms of steady income and, and work, um, when those finally shut down in the 80s, the South Side of the city uh, essentially lost its driving economy. The good news is that in the collection of these neighborhoods, there are assets uh, that root themselves in the ability to be a part of the next economy, the next economic driver for the South Side and really the next economic driver for the region. So one of the important pivots that we're making in this work is an asset-based approach to looking at uh, a new model of economic development. The second approach that we're taking on is recognizing that conventional economic development doesn't necessarily build wealth. And there's been a lot discussed lately around uh, the wealth gap and how we understand wealth different from income, the disparities we see around wealth and how wealth is so foundational and fundamental to not only our economic well-being, but our health and emotional and mental well-being. So a number of statistics are showing up in Chicago. So for example, um, the average, the same home on the south side of Chicago, on the black side of town, is devalued about $36,000 less than the same home on a white neighborhood. The wealth gap between south side Chicago and the rest of the city is almost half. And when we look at how both public and private investments are occurring in the city, we see deep disparities in that the majority of private capital is not going into impoverished neighborhoods. And in fact, the majority of civic and public investment is also not going into public neighborhoods. So economic development has to see um, help to eradicate the vulnerabilities that households feel. And one of the ways in which we believe we have to start approaching that is by talking more specifically about wealth. So we have a nine sort of principles that are based into our inclusive economy strategy that include ownership, placekeeping, uh, cultural production, partnerships and collaboration, 
capital attraction uh, and density. And we build that around reparative, restorative and resilient investments so that we can think about how to deconstruct the disparity between um, land values, public investment and a gap in retail spending by focusing strategies on land and home ownership, uh, civic and public investments in civic infrastructures and closing our retail and spending gap. To be more restorative, we wanna think about how to monetize cultural production, how to reinvest in our blue and green infrastructure like the Emerald Necklace, and how to strengthen capacity of our workforce to not only go into jobs, but to also be entrepreneurs. These things all tie then into both near-term and long-term um, economies that we can lean into to create jobs and entrepreneurship opportunities and wealth building, not only for residents of the South Side, but the city and region more broadly by creating these partnerships between anchor institutions and small business. One of the ways in which um, one of our first projects, so this organization was started two years ago. Um, we just got really up and running last year and they're just starting to attract some initial um, um, capital for some early action projects. One of the things that's important to us is if when the Obama Presidential Center opens, hopefully in about five years, we wanna make sure in parallel with the construction of that project, that there are deep, meaningful and visible investments that are happening in the neighborhood. So this project Terra Firma is actually modeled off of Philadelphia's land care project. So maybe that's something we can talk about and you can give me some insights on how well that's been working or, or not working. So there are over 205 acres of um, vacant land within these neighborhoods. And you can see by the glowy fluorescent green, the concentration of that. And so we believe that land holds an important asset for us rather than a liability. And we wanna to try to figure out a trajectory for how to capitalize on that. Um, we know that um, vacant land is always viewed as a liability. We think it has the opportunity to be an asset. And so how do we think about specifically the city owned land, which is a, a unique kind of asset and how do we use that to protect against some of the negative consequences that people are feeling with the construction of the presidential center, fears of displacement, fears of cultural erasure, uh, land speculation that's already happening. And at the same time, uh, transform some of the vulnerabilities that vacant land produces, like low light levels, fewer eyes on the street, lower land values, isolation, illegal dumping, and turn that into an asset for the community. So we're building out Terraformer to not only be a clean, clean and beautify strategy, which we believe will have a number of benefits, which you all have already proven around health, around environmental health, around skills building and workforce, along business development. So we are absolutely trying to model any success that you've already learned through this. But we also see this as only one step in a trajectory of how do we be also begin to engage neighbors, businesses, and community organizations that activate the space, that become stewards of the space. Um, when we look at the vacant land along corridors, how do we, in collaboration with business service organizations and business owners, use this as space of activation that help to promote and market and attract visitors and spending onto the corridors. But ultimately what we need to do is push this land into ownership ownership by existing residents, ownership by residents who used to live in the neighborhood, existing businesses who are renting, how do we move them into the space of ownership and development? And also how do we grow the capacity of local businesses and developers of color to actually be a part of this? So we really see Terraforma as seeding the pipeline of multiple levels of ownership, whether it's land, business, workforce, um, and so forth. We also have the opportunity, um, Chicago has uh, modeled its own architectural uh, biennial off of the Venice Biennale. And so um, this uh, coming fall will be the third or fourth um, version of the biennial. Um, it's weird. Um, and so um, they've been talking to us because they're, they're featuring, uh, the theme of it is called Available City. Don't know why that keeps happening. Um, Available City. 
uh, and they're featuring uh, vacant land as an opportunity to make architectural and design speculations about the city by thinking about vacant land. So we're pitching to them an idea of curating um, our, some of our terra firma sites through this narrative of migration, metropolis, mutilation, and mountaintop. And what that means is the, these neighborhoods were what was known as the Black Belt, um, the place where Black folks who had migrated through both phases of the Great Migration uh, coming out, out of the agricult agricultural economy into the industrial economy landed in this neighborhood. By doing so, this became uh, what you might say is the Harlem of Chicago, known as Bronzeville. Um, black entrepreneurs, mixed income um, neighbors populated this part of the city and it was one of the most robust black neighborhoods in the country, home of blues, um, home of a lot of first business starts. It also, by the middle of the century, um, becomes the home of deep uh, disinvestment um, and what I call land mutilation through public policies and land policies that begin to erode the physical character of the neighborhood, um, as well as the vibrancy and population of the neighborhood. Fast forward, it is also the home of uh, the first African-American uh, first lady, Michelle Obama. Uh, and now we have the first African-American president seating his presidential center in a neighborhood that is almost 90% African-American. So I'm ending uh, this talk with just um, kind of just going back to my outlet of art making. I started making these collages as we've been thinking about this because I think land narratives are so critical. And, and this is why I think um, every just city is unique and every proposition for the just city is unique. And so how do we begin to um, do this work by being mindful of our land narratives and our land histories and the juxtaposition uh, and trajectories of those land histories, uh, not only to root us uh, in place and understanding of place and populations, but also to inspire us to think um, about uh, possibilities for which we can't see uh, as we look at this vacancy. Uh, so just a quick note about this. I, I was kind of really interested in black artists that are from Chicago and their works uh, and how they get juxtaposed on this landscape of uh, both liability and asset. Um, so this is a work in progress, uh, how we put together uh, multiple um, stacked strategies for building um, the just city, um, and in this case, the just city with community wealth centered in the work uh, is the work in progress that we're on. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. This is, um, as a few people have said in the chat, this is really, really fascinating and an and important conversation. So I really appreciate you sharing. Um, we invite people to put your questions in the Q&A. We do have one to start with, wondering if you would comment on the Detroit Future Strategic Plan, which you helped to shape, and wondering if it's begun to achieve your goals for greater equity in a city that has suffered uneven development and been down in, uh, between downtown and the city's neighborhoods. Yeah, so uh, thank you for asking that question. I had slides on Detroit in here, and because I knew this was a short talk, I took them out and decided to focus on my recent work. Um, I do, I, I'm immensely proud of that project and it was probably one of the most difficult ones of my career um, because it was, it, was, it was the first time I think uh, that in collaboration with all the partners there to rethink what it means to do comprehensive citywide planning and what does it mean to um, be very rooted in the challenges of place but not such that it limits the possibilities, but that you aspire um, to think really differently about what the future might look like. Um, and so it was important to us to not put forward an approach that was kind of blind to some of the real challenges of the city, but to put forward approaches like you know, neighborhoods that might not be built back in the way in which they traditionally were, 
but there were new ways of creating um, value-based and even profit-driven sort of approaches to development that just might look spatially differently. Um, and so I think one of the successes of that work, which is now you know seven years old since we finished it, um, is that I feel like that there is, uh, Detroit already had a, a pretty strong civic infrastructure of participation, but I think post doing that work, um, there are many more activated pockets of civic participation and engagement and activism. And, and by activism, I just don't mean um, convening, but I actually mean doing the work and in collaboration with others mm -hmm. to do the work. And so I feel like that just blossomed and the role of uh, civic engagement and capacity, um, I think has really been rooted in, in Detroit in, in a city like I've not seen anywhere else. Um, I think the other thing is um, because we had so many different constituents participating in developing the plan, there's a sense of ownership by multiple sectors that there's a role that they can play in helping to execute it. It is not just the city government's plan. It is not just philanthropy's plan. It is not just a community plan. All that is to say, um, so new mayor comes in, they build a new team, they bring in a lot of additional resources. And I do think that some parts of the city are beginning to see some of the results of that. Um, the attraction of new capital in the city in a different way uh, has been really interesting. I think mm -hmm. that there will be others who would say there's still far more to do. Uh, there's still far more work to, um, see um, African-Americans, that city is 82% African-American, to see um, African-Americans in leadership spaces, to invest in African-Americans, to invest in African-American spaces. The good news is I think that the environment is such that um, the, the um, willingness to do that work and to try to deepen ways to do that work um, is in place and is slowly starting to take shape. Thank you. Um, John would love it if you could speak to the role of religious institutions or faith-based faith -based organizations in your, in your process. Um, you know, in Detroit or any of this work, um, they are a part of a broader group of community constituents that sit at different tables as a part of my work. Um, so uh, in the Chicago project, for example, um, the board of directors of that organization includes at the moment, I can think of at least three faith-based leaders, uh, four actually, uh, that are part, were part of the um, development and the ideation of the organization and are seated in leader positions there. Um, Chicago has a number, and this community in particular, has a number of faith-based led organizations uh, that are vital to achieving that robust agenda of um, inclusive economic growth. So they have really prominent seats at the table as a part of the work that, that I'm doing currently in Chicago, um, and similar they did uh, in Detroit. Thank you. And Marie says, fantastic ideas and actions. Um, she wonders, besides in Chicago, what are the other cities in which this is occurring? Are there smaller cities where you're engaging in this work? Um, you know, I think, you know, cities all around are trying different aspects of this. Um, my work tends to be at a pretty big scale. Um, but, but I would say that there are many communities that are attempting ways to um, close the gap uh, between that which is equitable and inclusive uh, as they do part of this work. Part of what my practice does is try to do this at scale, um, inclusive of what I would hope are the multiple partners that have to do it together and at the same time. Um, I've done some of this work uh, in Milwaukee uh, that was looking at more specifically the downtown, but recognized that they really needed to look at the ring of neighborhoods surrounding the downtown mm -hmm. in order to get in front of the pressures of the growth of the downtown, um, creating potentially negative impacts on surrounding neighborhoods. 
Um, I've advised Memphis, which is also has a very large African-American population um, before they launched what was their comprehensive planning uh, process. I'm advised the city of Pittsburgh, specifically the Heinz Endowments in thinking about ways that they can build um, a, 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 their program areas centered on a just Pittsburgh and more specifically looking at their grant making criteria for civic infrastructures and making sure the ways in which they're investing in the public realm can be done through a values based lens. So I'm experimenting. Uh, I, I tend to kind of work in one or two places for long periods of time. So I don't have a lot of projects in my portfolio. Uh, but, but what I like about that model is that we're able to embed and set ourselves with a community, dig in really deeply uh, and, and try to make some meaningful work happen because the, 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 um, the uh, convening of the multiple stakeholders to be a part of the process of making the plan is so critical. Uh, that takes a lot of work to do. Uh, the process I say is, is just as important as the outcome. I'm gonna, I'm jumping around the questions. There's some fantastic ones, but um, I think this one we'll start with here. Um, Betsy's wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the Rebuild Philadelphia initiative. Um, not a whole lot, that. again, uh, yeah, yeah, not a whole lot. I was not involved uh, at, uh, at the inception of the project. Um, we were simply asked to help them um, set up a tool for evaluating uh, the work. Um, as you all probably know more than me, the ambition of that project was to address issues of inequity as related to access to public realm and quality public spaces and investing in the public realm. Um, so doing that through means of contracting of how these things are built, designed and maintained by thinking about where the investment is placed um, by looking at the distribution uh, of facilities throughout the city, cities that uh, parts of town that may have been deficient in and not. So we were just kind of brought in to help them think about, well, how are you going to now evaluate whether or not you are achieving these goals? And what was interesting is what we're, you know, part of what we were asked to do is look at um, how others have done this in the field and how one might set up uh, a realistic approach to measuring impacts as a way of making sure that the program uh, could fulfill its ambitions and or figure out how to retool along the way in order to have more effective outcomes. Thank you, sorry, That's I had sneeze there. <laughs> a couple of questions here uh, are interesting about how, um, oh good, Tess, thanks for putting that in there. I was gonna stick the, the Tess just put the Rebuild Philadelphia website on the chat. So if anybody wants, to, wants that, you can click on that or open up right away or you can copy and paste it for later. Um, Couple questions about your how you engage the the full community. Um, one person says the language of planning and the language of um, the just city construct is not plain or simple. So, how have you and others ensured access for all people in meaningful discussion? Um, it, it it varies depending on where I'm working, um, because on the surface it looks like you know cities have common issues. But the civic and cultural dynamic of a city is always really different. Um, in St. Louis, for example, where I've recently completed a project with colleagues for a five mile urban greenway, um, St. Louis, another very deeply uh, segregated city, north and south with the central corridor running through the middle, um, serving as a kind of divide between black and white disinvestment and investment thinking about where the alignment of the corridor could be to help physically break those barriers, but also to think about other social um, and cultural and political barriers that it needed to break. So we needed to think about a way of, and the client wanted an sort of equitable approach to doing this. So we had to figure out, well, how do we first define what equity means for St. Louis? Uh, how do we get folks to weigh in on the various nuances of how we understand that? Those of us who are professionals have a very professional language. When I'm talking to the you know, 65 year old that has grown up and lived on North St. Louis all his life and seen the ebbs of flows of disinvestment, 
how that gentleman is going to talk about equity may be very different. So we set about creating a number of different platforms to acquire that information. And again, what it showed is that when you throw a word like that out there, um, people describe it by using other values. So what became visible is that what, what the project was really about was a set of values and aspirations that people wanted the project to achieve, not just something we were trying to cram a single definition of equity to and found that we didn't need to, right? And so um, we began to sort of flesh out what that meant and thereby creating a language that was inclusive of multiple values that could be realized in multiple spaces and multiple combinations and through multiple means. So we ended up through that type of engagement uh, which happened in a number of different ways through focus groups and workshops and public events and surveys. Um, we were able to kind of create 26 different equitable practices that dealt with businesses, jobs and wealth creation, quality of life in neighborhoods, uh, cultural identity and civic participation and capacity. Mm -hmm. So that way you can begin to see how those values begin to overlay into tangible approaches or strategies that the community could take as the Greenway was being built. So, 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 so really listening carefully and, and meeting the community where the community is instead of imposing. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's gotta, and it's yeah. gonna be different. And, and the way in which you know, communities engage is also very different. Um, you know, in, in Milwaukee and St. Louis, uh, their civic capacity or their culture for engagement, we found wasn't as robust as it was in Detroit. Um, and so how do you find ways of getting to folks that you want to be involved? Your client's network may only be so large. So how do you expand that network to get to the network that can get to the network that can get to people? And that usually has to really be carefully designed uniquely for each city because those dynamics are very different. Um, this one is one I think that is a kind of a, a hot topic definitely here in, in Philadelphia. Uh, how does historic preservation become a layer of assessment, especially with regard to historic districts in any locally or federally designated properties? How does it become a layer of assessment? the decision-making process of how you, I think, how you engage in the process of how to rebuild or build a, a more just city? Yeah, I mean, a couple different ways. I'll maybe refer back to my time in DC, which is uh, a, a historic city, both in terms of uh, formal designations, but also just the allure of DC as being thought of as a historic city with very strict um, development requirements that keep its uh, spatial and visual iconography quite strong. Um, so, you know, the work we did there always confronted uh, notions of preservation or conservation and the narratives that that sort of set up in different parts of the city. Um, and so it's, it, it, um, um, <coughs> So there was a very robust conversation about that. Um, the city was also growing. And so we had to very actively figure out ways to encourage thoughtful uh, development that was in the context of a historic city without always feeling the need to replicate history in the context of a historic city, something I'm sure you all grapple with often. And I sort of felt like my role, particularly as this was my first public sector job coming out of architecture and, you know, and practicing as a designer to now regulating design. I think part of my job was to create a culture that was not too prescriptive on design, but really encourage design innovation. How are we encouraging designers to create a new context adjacent to and in the context of history that celebrates that history, but isn't always trying to replicate it. And in DC, where there is this context of foreground and background buildings, it was also important for us to send signals about 
the, uh, how to situate foreground sites and background sites. Again, mm -hmm. without being overly prescriptive, because as a designer, we don't want to be told, you know, you don't want design guidelines that completely hamstring your work. Uh, but you do want design innovation and you do want to challenge designers, particularly in the strict building envelope that you have in DC, of how to push to create a, a beautiful city uh, in a modern era. So, you know, looking at precedents, what other much older cities have done in European context, for example, was, was inspirational. Um, having uh, different types of architects and designers advise us on our work test the type of regulations and guidelines we were doing to see what the limits uh, of that were. Um, and having, you know, really thoughtful preservation and conservation partners uh, through our regulatory bodies and etc. And really, you know, being really thoughtful and collaborative even within the Department of Planning of how we were taking on those challenges kind of project by project. Thank you. Um, and Valerie has a question. Um, Another question related to to design about density. I'm um, wondering if you could talk about density. That, uh, of course, here as as many other cities, it's a point of contention for those who are concerned about displacement and unaffordability because we're getting these large scale market rate apartments going up um, to replace vacant lots or crumbling buildings or old buildings um, with the, with the idea that eventually it'll it will increase affordability. But in the current scheme of things is mostly displacing current residents. Density is, is a hard question. I mean, that's a hard question without a context by which to answer it. So I can't sit here and say I am against density. Uh, density looks a lot of different ways. Density is not always about a tall building. Um, there's a great publication produced by the Lincoln Institute on Land Policy called Visualizing Density. If you guys don't have it in the Athenaeum, you probably do. Um, but it, it, it's a great way of understanding the different ways and, and scales and shapes that density can take on in a city that is not always vertical. Um, so, you know, that's a question to be asked about a specific context and a, and a particular set of urban issues uh, that it sounds like the, the audience member is tying it to both development type and the, the, the challenges or tensions around development and growth and dislocation and scale and affordability and price point, right? Uh, all of those things, you're absolutely right, are commingled in the conversations we have about density and where it can occur. And the reasons why a public sector might be arguing for that approach to solve for different things. Um, so it's hard to say when it's wrong and when it's right, uh, what it should look like and when you do it because it is wrapped into a whole other set of, of, I think, urban issues and considerations that I would imagine your public officials are trying to take on. Someone else is asking um, if you have some ideas about how COVID uh, is transforming the communities in which you're, you're working and how that loss of tax revenue from the relocation of a significant portion of the workforce out of central city areas might impact the availability of resources. Deeply is how it's impacting places where I'm working deeply. So just to go back to Chicago, um, those businesses on those commercial corridors were devastated. And again, when you're talking about, you know, contexts like that, they were already starting from a deficit, which was some of the demographics that I showed. So layer on to that, the complete economic shutdown on top of a health crisis, um, it, it makes it incredibly difficult to even, to get back to the deficit you were before COVID and then climb yourself out of the structural deficit uh, that had been in place uh, for decades. So. That's not, you know, that devastation isn't just happening to the deep, the most deeply devastated communities pre-COVID. It's happening to businesses that were robust uh, before. So the challenge is incredibly significant, which is why the approach we're trying to take in Chicago, which is to seed any opportunity, even if it's as simple as tending to vacant land, 
as opportunity for building opportunity around workforce, community engagement, community capacity, business development, business contracting, land ownership, land development as the trajectory for how all our investments have an opportunity to help pull us out of this. Um, but it's gonna be very, very hard. Um, we got an initial $2.5 million to deal with over 200 uh, lots. I'm sure you guys could tell us that that is woefully insufficient. Um, so, um, but it's a start and it's gonna, it's gonna require some very creative um, approaches to accessing different forms of capital. Um, and stacking those forms of capital um, with different strategies that are working simultaneously. Marie is, is wondering, obviously you're teaching these ideas at Harvard in the Graduate School of Design. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you seeing these ideas and conversations and, and concepts and practices disseminating more broadly in architectural scholarly circles and in academia? Well, I feel like that's my that's part of what I'm doing and, and the reason why I was really intentional to want to both practice and teach uh, is because I wanted the space um, to take the work that I was doing, particularly in government, which is, you know, you feel like you don't have time to think. Um, to process um, critique and interrogate what's not working? Why is it not working? I now, you know, have some distance between some of my major projects so that I can really evaluate them uh, through a more critical lens. While at the same time, I'm still practicing so I can then push things that I have researched or that my colleagues are research or that we're doing in the space of the academy back out into the work. So, you know, the Chicago project I'm working on now, I would say, is a combination of lessons learned from Detroit, lessons learned from looking at what did and didn't work in DC, lessons learned from the ideation that my students do when we give them projects. Uh, and they are, you know, they are to be speculative. Um, and to see the ways with which they might push themselves back out. So Chicago is one of the first projects where I'm massing from a number of different spaces of practice in the academy to test out, like, can we do a new model of wealth creation? How can I create a program that starts with clean and green, but then ends up with the, the entity or person that is being the steward for that land, first right of refusal to own it and develop it. So we'll see what happens. I'll come back in five years and let you know <laughs> if any of this has been effective, but I think, you know, <laughs> the career I've designed for myself at this point has allowed me to play back and forth between those two things, uh, create research and scholarship, push the research and scholarship out in an applied way, and then do it in reverse. So we have two, two final questions that hopefully mm -hmm. um, won't take too long to answer. Dana is curious about timeline, how how you or the cities in which you work manage the pressure of private developer interests when pursuing ideals of equity and wondering what, what types of policy should cities be in, or might cities institute uh, in order to provide enough time for communities to meaningfully engage in this process and the questions and the, the conversations? Yeah, well, well, one that is a plug for planning, in my opinion, um, in DC, for example, you know, we were right up against the edge. Development was already happening and just sort of bulldozing to the, to the east part of the city. So we were in catch up mode to try to figure out what tools we had as a city to create better public benefit and balance. So where we had land, um, building into the disposition of that land requirements for affordability, requirements for equity participation, not just on the pre-development and construction side, but actually equity owners, right? And so you're playing catch up with the tools you have and trying to push them into, you know, the marketplace. You know, in a city like St. Louis and at the time Detroit um, and in Chicago, which is kind of on that cusp, you know, we are, we are being intentional about what are the anti-dislocation strategies that we need to put in the ground now before speculation becomes out of hand, before development comes out of hand, because that will never go away, right? It's not going away. 
So part of this is about how you can how you can foresee and get ahead of putting in place policies and practices that lessen the vulnerability of places and people and household and businesses before you see the market headed that way. Now, that's a double-edged sword because government is also an instigator of certain types of gentrification, but we can also be in, in the, the space of using that tool, um, layering on a different set of values like lessening vulnerabilities and trying to use that private capital to address those values. So this is where I begin to start, I'm beginning to experiment with the mashup of the, the value proposition of what we're trying to do, and then how to push capital towards helping us address that. And so I think we have to continue to figure out ways to do that because that is just a part of our, our existence. Uh, we need to figure out more creative ways that it can work for us. Yeah, and, and as George is, uh wondering how cities can learn more about engaging with your organization to to do this work and, and, and do these exercises? Well, you know, we're just a little research lab in the <laughs> at the Graduate School of Design. Like I wish I was a nonprofit arm, but at the moment we're not. So anything that we've created, we've we've put up onto our website, designforthejustity.org. And we've just made it open source. So we encourage you to download it, use it, the tools that we've created. Um, we encourage you to use them, adapt them, create them your own way. Um, we've had, we have had occasions where people have um, found ways of, uh, and resources to bring us out to be collaborative partners with you. And in fact, some of the ways that we advance the research is through having funded sponsors uh, that help us do this work in collaboration with you. We created a master class in Rotterdam uh, that was supported by the Institute of Architecture there. Um, we did the work um, on the public realm indicators um, with foundational partners in New York and the Department of Transportation. So we, we're happy to advance our research through the collaboration with real partners looking to do this work. Um, and then my practice, Urban American City, the website is urbanac.city. Um, you can hire me. <laughs> Uh, but most of what we have is, is free and available uh, for your use and dissemination. Um, and we welcome feedback um, and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. This has been an, an absolutely fabulous evening, Tony, your generosity of time and ideas and just say sharing open source on uh, the designforthejustcity.org website for all who are interested in learning more and diving more deeply in. Some of the other uh, items that you mentioned, people can find those at the Athenaeum Library and read. We're so grateful for your time and look forward to hopefully further conversations as, as things move on and, and, and we can learn more about the work that you are doing and how we can engage with Philadelphia on, on moving our own uh, Rebuild Philadelphia plan forward. Uh, coming up next week, we have Women's War with Stephanie McCurry and um, the following week, 25th, Gretchen Soren, Driving While Black, African-American Travel, and the Road to Civil Rights. We hope you'll enjoy those. And um, Tony, we'll give you the last word. Oh, I was just going to say thank you very much. I'm in New York. I'm a train ride away. We'd be happy to come back to the city. I haven't been there in a couple of years since uh, the work we were doing. And thank you so much for inviting me to this forum. Uh, and the great thank questions, you. by the way. They were really awesome. Thank you. They were great, weren't they? And so, yeah, it'll be, oh, I can't wait till we can get you here in person, maybe do a workshop, uh, somehow be able to have you in person engaging um, folks with this, these, these, these questions and ideas and thoughts. It'd be fantastic. Um, thank you to everybody who showed up and um, share with other people what you've been learning and keep the conversation going. And we look forward to seeing all of you face-to-face -to -face too when you're able to come by the Athenaeum.